Hello, America. Welcome to a special edition of the Glenn Beck Program. America's history is being distorted, and our kids aren't being taught the truth. It's just one of the things that we learned on this program, and one of the things this show has tried to do from the beginning is set the record straight. Where else on TV would you hear that some women in the 1700s were actually allowed to vote? Did you know that? Or that African Americans were judges, politicians, preachers at white churches. They were patriots in the revolution. Did you know that? Tonight you're going to get a crash course on our founding fathers. Historian David Barton of Wall Builders will be joining us throughout the hour. He's got some stuff today that I can guarantee that most has never learned in school. But first, here's the reaction we got to Founders Fridays. I was really thrilled to see how popular the shows became. I, I mean, the feedback was just phenomenal. Part of what people responded is, I've never heard this before. I'm just now finding out about these things. Well, this is my first time ever hearing is, why didn't I learn any of this? I think there's a couple reasons for that. The, the way we have taught American history for 60 years is called deconstructionism. And deconstructionism is an attempt to destroy or deconstruct what's going on. And within that framework, what you do is you always teach the negatives, not the positives, because that's what they've been taught in school. If there's a wart on the nose of American history, they heard it. If it was the witch trials, if it was treatment of Indians, if it was slavery, they heard it. Didn't hear any of the good stuff, but heard lots of the negative stuff. I think the two Founders Fridays that I heard the most about were the, the black founders, part one and part two, and then the women founders. I mean, we have some concept of who Sam Adams is and Ben Franklin and the others, but it was like brand new territory on the black founders and, and the women of the revolution. On the Women of the Revolution show, we learned all about the role of our founding mothers, the role they played right alongside our founding fathers. But what took many of our viewers by surprise was this. Let me ask the audience, on uh, when did women get the right to vote? 19... 1920. Yes, 1920. What would you say if I told you, not true, women could vote in the 1700s? Would anybody believe me? New Jersey, they wrote into the Constitution the right for women to vote. So women started voting in New Jersey in 1776. And that was a right that the Founding Fathers put into the documents. And women had voted in colonial America before that as well. I, in Pennsylvania, back in, in, in the French and Indian War, etc. But they put it in but the it Constitution. Was, all right, but it wasn't in, in Pennsylvania. Was it a constant? It was not constant. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the voting rights were, were tied a lot of times to ownership of property. If you own property, you could vote. So women could vote if they owned property, but a lot of times being married to the husband's property is in the husband's name. But if the husband died and the woman, woman inherited the property, she could vote. By 1809, most of the women were voting with the Federalists. So when the Anti-Federalists got power in New Jersey, they said, ah, wipe out the women's vote. They're voting in the wrong political party. We're not going to be able to su sustain ourselves with it. So that's really where the woman's right to vote went away. It wasn't on, on grounds of equality or inequality. It was on the grounds of, ah, they vote for the wrong party. Now that we've got control, we're going to take the power away. On that program, what also took a lot of viewers by surprise was that some women actually served in the military during the American Revolution. I have to ask you, about this handsome lady. 1782, she wanted to do something for her country. She dressed like a man and went and enlisted. Now, what's interesting is she's 22 years old at the time, and, and the other guys in the Army always kidded her about, you, just, you never shave. You're just a kid. Yeah, of course she doesn't shave. She's, she's a lady. She got wounded in a battle up at West Point, and she treated the wound herself so no one would find out what her gender was. Holy uh, she later, in, in Philadelphia, came up with a really high fever, almost unconscious, and so a physician had to check her and at that time found out what her gender was. So when they found out the gender, they quietly moved her out of the Army. But General Henry Knox is the one that gave her an honorable discharge out of the Army at West Point. Wow. She ends up with a military pension because she served as a soldier. And if you were a soldier, you got the pension. So pretty, pretty cool story. Pritchard. She was commissioned by Washington. She was commissioned because she, she got the name, Mary is her name, Molly is the nickname. 
Um, in the Battle of Monmouth, 1778, June, really, really, really hot day. And if you're part of the artillery crew with all that powder going off and the heat and everything, and so guys were falling from exhaustion. She was running back forth to the creek and the well, carrying pitchers of water for them to keep dehydrating. And that's how she got the name Molly Pitcher. Well, when her husband fainted from exhaustion, she stepped right in and became the rammer, and that thing kept the gun firing and did so throughout the rest of the battle. And at the end, they found out what she'd done, that she'd kept that gun alive. But because it takes several guys in the crew to keep the gun alive. You got to have the rammer and the cleaner. You got to have the one that, that puts the, the uh, powder, the guy who fires it, names it. So she kept that. That gun going throughout the battle. And at the end, she was commissioned as a sergeant in the Continental Army. Now, Washington, we think, did it. It may have been General Nathaniel Green, but either way, it was a general that commissioned her. Uh, she served throughout the rest of the American Revolution. When she died, she was given a military funeral. She was buried with the honors of war in a military funeral at her death. Um, great lady, served throughout the Revolution. Women were not the only unknown heroes of the Revolution. By far, the Founders Friday specials that got the most reaction from our viewers were the two shows we did on our black founding fathers. In black history, it wasn't all just slavery. Oh, yeah, it was there. But look, we had black founding fathers elected to office. We had a lot of black heroes who were heroes in the American Revolution who were great military leaders. I want to show you a painting of the Battle of uh, Bunker Hill. Here's the Battle of Bunker Hill. A bunch of white guys, right? Unless you know where to look, right here. That's Peter Salem. He was actually the hero of the battle. It doesn't look like he's a hero there. He looks like he's cowering behind the white guy with a sword. He was the hero of the battle. And he saved scores of American lives that day. Why don't we know this? Look at the picture of the Battle of Lexington. 150 Americans. There it is. Do you see any faces of color in this painting? They were all members of the Reverend Jonas Clark's church. They went out. They were actually, if I'm not mistaken, David, they were in, they were in church at the time, right? He, he called them together at church, okay. yes. Okay, so uh, we could call together at church and then said, let's go. And they went to defend their town. When the shot heard around the world was over that day, there were American, 18 Americans lying on the ground. What you don't see in this painting are the equal numbers of whites and blacks. They were white and black patriots. It was a mixed church. Did you even know that happened? One of those injured patriots on the ground in this painting was a black man named Prince Estabrook. I bet you never heard of Prince Estabrook before. How about the uh, painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware? Bunch of white guys, right? No. Look here. African-American helping row the boat across. You know what his name was? Prince Whipple. He fought alongside Washington during the Revolution. Take a look at this one, this uh, painting of, uh, this is uh, the uh, Marquis uh, de Lafayette. He, if you look at this, you just think, oh yeah, and then he had, he made his slave dress up like I, I don't know what. But that's what you would think, right? This guy is incredibly important. This guy may have won the Revolutionary War. James Armistead was his name. How did he win the Revolutionary War? Double spy. Basically, the Brits thought that he was spying for them, but he was spying for General Washington. He'd give the Brits bad intel and reveal the good critical information to General Washington. Did you know this story? Why? I'm, I'm so tired of people saying, well, it was just the white people, white people, white people. No, no. Why are we intentionally leaving others out? When did America have its first African-American judge? 1768. Wentworth Cheswell, New Hampshire, elected to office in New Hampshire. He was reelected for the next 49 years, held eight different political positions. Really cool story uh, about him is we all know that Paul Revere made his midnight ride. We also know he wasn't the only guy riding that night. Mm -hmm. Another guy riding went with Cheswell, black and white. Riding now, how side side. is it possible? Did you know that we had an African American ride to say the British are coming? The British are coming. Yeah. <laughs> Amy did. Amy did. Anybody else besides Amy know that? 
Two, three. Okay, three people in the audience. Yeah. He, that is, he, was, he was such a great guy, and we never hear about him because he rode north and Paul Revere rode west. And Revere was going after Reverend Jonas Clark's church because that's where Hancock and Adams were, which was him. And that's where we had blacks and whites, as you pointed out, laying on the ground after that battle. Wentworth Cheswell rode north telling people the British are coming. And it was from the north that all those people came to Boston to take on the British at Bunker Hill and everywhere else. This guy right here, this is Lemuel Haynes. Lemuel Haynes is uh, a soldier in the American Revolution. He's a black preacher. He's the first black preacher ordained in America that was a pastor of a white congregation in Vermont, Massachusetts, New York, several places. A, he, wait, a black professor in black a preacher, white... That's right, in a I white mean, church. Yeah, black, uh, black minister. Black minister in a white church in four different states. He was ordained in the Congregational Denomination in 1785. Mm -hmm. he received, he's the first black to receive a master's degree in America. When did we have the first Speaker of the House? Uh, 1789. 1789. When did we have our first black Speaker of the House? I bet most people would say never. Never. Except it was right here. Joseph Hayne Rainey. Joseph Hayne Rainey of South Carolina is first black to preside over the House of Representatives. Uh, these are the first seven blacks elected to Congress. You have here Senator Hiram Rhodes Revels, the first black U.S. Senator elected. He was a minister of the gospel. He was a missionary. He worked with Frederick Douglass. He recruited three regiments of black soldiers in, in the uh, Civil War, and he was a missionary to slaves in the South. Uh, you, you have here Benjamin. Turner, uh, Josiah Wall, the large, th this guy right here is really cool. Uh, Robert Brown Elliott is probably the most brilliant guy of that era. He actually took on the vice president of the Confederacy in a debate on the floor and just tore his head off. What was the relationship of our founders with African Americans? It depends on where you were. If you're in the South, it's a different relationship, right? It was. But our founders, uh, the ones that really put everything together, um, they, they, they came from a world where we don't even understand it. We're just, we're striving yeah. to get back to this place, yeah. are we not? We are. Um, and I want to show, the, now these are, these are just, uh, these are from old newspapers. This one is Caesar Glover, a colored man supposed to be about 80 years of age. This is a, a, a um, obituary. Obituary. Uh, he was brought from Africa as a slave when a child. He served in the Revolutionary War and is one of the pensioners of the United States. Okay, this one is um, uh, at Providence at an advanced age. Bristol Rhodes, a black man of the late Revolutionary Army, in which he long served with deserved reputation at the siege of New York uh, of Yorktown. He was severely wounded, having misfortune, un unfortunately lost a leg and an arm, and has since assisted on pension. Same story. Same story. Um, a colored man named Henry Hill uh, died at Chillicothe not long since the age of 80 years. He served faithfully in the Revolutionary War and was a participant in the battles of Lexington, Brandywine, uh, Monmouth, and Princeton and Yorktown. He was interned with honors of the war. What does that mean? Not only a pension, but he got a full military funeral as any veteran would get. So that's a military funeral with all the honors that go with being a veteran. How many people here had any idea that our founders, the people at this time, would, would take an African American and bury them with the full military rights and honors. Anybody here believe that before just now? This is good stuff. And again, it's not to say that slavery and, and the Jim Crow laws, et cetera, didn't happen. They did, but we got taught that in school. What we didn't get taught was the positive side of that aspect of history. We did so many programs, but there was a lot more we could have done. I mean, this could go forever. We didn't do anything about all the Jewish founding fathers. Mordecai Sheftel was a Jewish patriot who led the forces in, uh, across Georgia. Uh, Francisco Salvador was the first Jewish patriot killed in the American Revolution, was ambushed by the British and the Indians and killed. If you go to Chicago to the business district, you will see there a statue of three great folks in the American Revolution, George Washington, Robert Morris, and Haim Solomon. And Robert Morris and Ham Solomon were the two financiers that gave Washington what he needed to fight the war financially, one a Jew and one a Christian, and Washington holding the hands of both of them. And another aspect we hear nothing about is the young people. I mean, the fact that you take a John Quincy Adams at eight years old with his musket out going after the British. Well, you look at Andrew Jackson, he was already a military prisoner of war at 11 years old from fighting in the Revolution. Uh, you take someone like uh, James Iredell, at 17 years old, he was the chief financial officer over North Carolina. So there's just so much history we didn't get into that we could have gotten into on Founders Fridays. Faith 
hope, and charity. Why we matched Sam Adams, George Washington, and Benjamin Franklin up with those virtues. Ahead. As a homeschool mom, I used a lot of the material that Glenn presents on Founders Friday. It's just been a great way to have some good discussion on American history. I'm Jim Darty from New Jersey, and Glenn, I love watching Founders Fridays. We're currently fighting a war on terror, and this lasted for a number of years, but most Americans have no clue that this is deja vu. This is actually round two in the war on terror. We actually sent four military expeditions overseas to the same region where we're fighting now to fight Muslim terrorism back then. We spent literally 32 years fighting Muslim terrorism from 1784 in the Continental Congress through the presidency of George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison up until 1816, for 32 years we fought Muslim terrorism. Matter of fact, George Washington, by 1795, the seventh year of his administration, 16% of the federal budget was dedicated to the war on terror. Our first three diplomats that were sent by America to negotiate with Muslim terrorists were John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin. And you read their letters back to the State Department and you'd think it's coming out of Afghanistan or Iraq today. You're watching a special look back at Founders Fridays. You might remember we kicked off the series with this man right here. Sam Adams. Faith. Sam Adams. Most people know him as the beer guy. But Sam Adams had faith in God, faith in our country, and faith that there would be freedom. He was the delegate from Massachusetts. He had been involved in the cause of independence from the very beginning. He had, in, by this time, earned the title Father of the American Revolution. Didn't make him popular with the British. The British virtually destroyed his home. He had to leave his family for long periods of time. He was in continual danger of capture and death, always. But Adams had a faith in God, and he had a faith in the cause of liberty, and that's what was needed faith. He spoke to his fellow congressmen. This is after we lost in Brandywine and things were looking bleak and Congress gets together and he stood in front of Congress and he said, gentlemen, your spirits appear oppressed with the weight of public calamities. He then told them, you don't show that to the American people. He told Congress, quote, our affairs, it is said, are desperate. If this be our language, then they are indeed. If we wear long faces, long faces are going to become fashionable. The eyes of the people are upon us. Sam Adams knew that if Congress openly showed their fear to the people, the cause of liberty would be over. Because people will follow and say, it was like when George Washington wept. I don't think our leader should be crying. He also told them, now imagine, these are the people that signed the Declaration of Independence. These are the brave, brave people. He said, we have proclaimed to the world our determination to die freemen rather than slaves. We have appealed to heaven for the justice of our cause. And in heaven, we have placed our trust. How great is that? How many of us have that faith now where we can say, I trust you. I trust you. Our cause is just. Uh, Ira, you are, you are here because of, of your book. It changed my, uh, my course. Ira Stoll wrote uh, Samuel Adams' A Life. Um, and I read this and I remember bringing it in and saying, my gosh, I'd bring it into work every day and I'd read it to people and I'd go, did, did, did you know this? And uh, those are my paintings, these are copies of them, but that is the, re the reason why Sam Adams' faith is because of your book. It's amazing. Um, we also have David Barton here from Wall Builders. Um, and I want to just, I want to spend some time uh, just getting to know this guy a little bit. First of all, did you know who you were going to find when you started doing research for your book? Well, I had a vague idea that he was one of the most steadfast of the founding fathers, but I really didn't know what motivated it. And you're right, it really was the faith. And as I got into it, I saw that Samuel Adams really believed that God was on the side of the Americans and that they were like the Israelites fleeing slavery in Egypt. Yeah, it was, it was amazing, David, but he wasn't unique in that, was he? But he was probably the leader 
at the time, or the most? He, he was probably the leader. The, the British actually called him the puppet master, and they knew that he was behind things, and that's why they wanted his body. I mean, that order you read was, go find him, find Hancock, kill him. If we can get these guys killed, we're going we're to save this thing. Now, he is a guy. We, we're separation of church and state. We're not a religious, and, and that is the big lie here. Yeah. We are. These guys all defended religion. Yeah. They, they would go because people would say, well, no, you're not going to be that religion. Yeah. But they said, no, no, no. You can be as religious as you want. That's right. You don't, don't go after another religion. It's yeah. not about one religion. We need to be religious people. But he wrote the Massachusetts Constitution, yeah. or he was involved in the Massachusetts Constitution. He was one of the foremost writers. He and his second cousin, John Adams, and, and Hancock were really the principal guys behind that. And John Adams is the one who wrote the foreword for all of this, but Sam had me his fingers all over this. I am Samuel Adams. I was named after the boy prophet, and I'm related to him. And every day I get told, oh, you're related to that beer guy. And it, <laughs> it, it infuriates me. Like, there's, there's never really a good, quick answer. Like, what, what's, like, the defining thing that he did? Because nobody knows. People say he's the, he was the president, which is, people yeah. don't know their history at all in America. So what is it? What's the one thing I say to these people? What did he do? A uh, couple things. One, can I respond to the, mm -hmm. the beer thing? He owned what was called a malt house. And malt back then is not beer today. And by the way, that didn't do well. He didn't do well in any business he had, but he had a malt house. But according to founding father Benjamin Rush, who's, who's called the father of temperance, he said neither malt nor wine nor beer could you get drunk on in the founding era. They, they didn't con it had just enough alcohol to kill the bugs in the water, and that was it. So it wasn't even a beer that we consider today. That's a complete misnomer. They've stuck his name on something that, that really was not his. Uh, the thing you can say about him is there is no America as the United States without the leadership of Sam Adams. That's why they called him the father of the American Revolution. Next, this guy, Hope. You're watching the Glenn Beck special on Founders Fridays. More to come in a moment. One of the reasons that Founders Fridays did so well is that people are hungry for their own history, just like they're now hungry for the Constitution. I mean, look across the nation, Tea Party's popping up, 9-12 groups, everybody wants to read the Constitution. That, that's part of history. I mean, we got groups now looking at reading the Federalist Papers. We haven't done that in 100 years. So we're really hungry for our history, and Founders Friday's really filled that void. You probably know the next Founding Father as my favorite. Most people will say George Washington is one of the best presidents, but they don't know why. George Washington was truth. To me, the only kind of hope that there is comes from truth. He was, at the time, known as the indispensable man. When George Washington was around, things were a mess. And he was the indispensable man because nobody trusted anybody. All the states were arguing with each other. Nobody, you couldn't sell anything across the border. The whole thing was falling apart. Here's George Washington, a man who at 16 was out surveying land for his country, which was then Great Britain. All he wanted to do was go to Mount Vernon and be a farmer. His countries, Great Britain and then the United States of America, had him serving for year after year after year after year. After he won the Revolutionary War, he went back to be that farmer in Mount Vernon. In 1791, things started to fall apart, and they came knocking at his door and said, George, we need you, because the whole thing is falling apart. I'm paraphrasing, but I think it was pretty close to, have I not yet done enough for my country? No. I think what I like about George Washington is most of the choices he made, he didn't want to make. Most of the things he did, he didn't want to do. He was revered for it. He was revered. And I think it's because they knew that in the end, he didn't matter to him. It was just doing the right thing. That's what mattered. I made George Washington faith, hope, and charity. Um, I made Washington hope because I was trying to figure out why that Obama hope doesn't work and because it's false hope. It's not telling you the truth. And 
I mean, it's, uh, it's ironic to me that we make up a lie about I shall not tell a lie on George Washington when there's so many great truth stories with him. Would you say that he's the best yeah. example of hope? Can I answer that question? Yeah. Um, you hit the nail right on the head, Glenn. There is no figure in the history of this nation that represents hope as well as George Washington. Uh, and, and just let me give you a couple of reasons why I believe that. One, we've already been talking about. And it is so astonishing to me that we have uh, writers today who say that not only that the founders were deists, but in some cases atheists. Now, George Washington was the most vocal, but virtually all of them said that the reason that this country was created was because of the intervention of God. And uh, nobody said it more often or more effectively than George Washington. But the other thing is this, and, and if that, by the way, um, when you consider who these men were and what they accomplished, you know, these were the most brilliant and the most insightful mm -hmm. political philosophers and statesmen in the world. In one place, at one time, in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and here they're all saying it was God who used us to do this. And, and you have to ask yourself, were they all wrong? Was he ever afraid? Washington, there is no evidence in the record that he feared death. There's no evidence that he feared uh, being injured in battle. What he was afraid of was that he was not up to the task, that uh, he didn't have what America needed to provide the and leadership that they were calling on him he to provide. He didn't at first, did he? When he first, I mean, the most surprising thing that I learned about George Washington, we think of him as a great general. He stunk on ice at the beginning <laughs> for like a year or so. I mean, he, we lost New York, we lost everything. They were chasing him all around. He grew well, into it. <laughs> Do you think that somebody like George Washington could be in office today? <laughs> Neither wow. of you? Well, you know, you said uh, before we started that uh, people are beginning to wake up. I, I think that Americans are looking for somebody like George Washington. Here is a man who was unanimously elected as the commander-in-chief of the new American army unanimously elected um, as the presiding officer of the Constitutional Convention, unanimously elected by the Electoral College twice as the President of the United States, didn't want to do any of it. Uh, what kind of person is that? But there was something in him. The, the subtitle on the biography is The Man Who United America. When we started, we were not united. And it's true, Samuel Adams earned the title, the father of the American Revolution. Jefferson even called him the patriarch of liberty. But there was only one man who could have been called the father of our country, and that's George Washington. Is there any president that in, in your studies, is there any president that has even come close to the role he played? Right guy, right time. And it it I can't point to one. So we've covered faith and we've covered hope. Next, charity and why Ben Franklin's face. And still to come, life after Founders Fridays. Hi, I'm Dennis from Long Island. Uh, Founders Fridays inspired me to uh, go back and start reading a lot of the books that uh, they've highlighted on the show. My name is Dustin, I'm from Waterloo, Iowa. And Glenn, I'd like to thank you for doing your Founding Fathers Fridays. Benjamin Franklin was our first foreign ambassador. He was our first spy. He was a scientist that changed the world. He was a geographer, a postmaster, and to me, he is charity. Well, you think about with Benjamin Franklin, the kite, and he's on the money. But there's a lot missing in what's taught about our founders like Franklin. Did you know that Ben Franklin, who hated the poor so much, he created the nation's first hospital. Pennsylvania Assembly didn't want to do it. The idea was about to die, and Franklin said, okay, wait, wait a minute, we gotta have a hospital. He issued a challenge. He said, how about if I raise half the money? 
If I can raise 2,000 pounds from private citizens, this was an impossible feat at the time, you have to raise the other and you match the funds. The assembly, think of that they just hit the lottery because this guy's never going to be able to do it. Nobody is, nobody is going to say, oh yeah, let me give money to build a hospital, you know, because people are hate mongers. They took him up on that and uh, he did it. That hospital is still operating today. Franklin proved that a private citizen could indeed effect change. Besides the hospital, he also started the first library, the Lending Library. That was his idea. After a uh, massive fire ravaged the city of Philadelphia in 1730, he helped establish the first volunteer fire company in America. When the government refused to act against the threat from the French and Indian Wars, he printed the plain truth and went door to door organizing the first militia in America. In short order, he had 10,000 members in his militia. He's a hate monger. Live free or die. Live free or die. Well, join or, or join or die. Join or die. Yeah. Um, this is probably if, where you start with Franklin. Uh, it's one of two major Franklin contributions to who we are. Uh, the year 1754, the uh, French are stepping up their operations to drive us into the sea. Indian raids on the frontier, French troops coming up the Ohio, coming across the Great Lakes. And the militia system just isn't working. And Franklin, who is now publishing the most important newspaper, the author of the Poor Richard's Almanacs, the postmaster for the colonies, starts circulating the idea of an American militia. All the colonies chipping in according to their population, an army of its own, of our own, which would work with the British, work under British command, and undertake aggressive operations to push the French back down the Ohio. He created essays in his newspapers. He mailed hundreds of letters all over the colonies. He started debates. He started arguments. And then in June, there was going to be a meeting in Albany, New York, to rebribe the Indian allies of our side and uh, make sure that fix was in, and then to have a conference of all the military leaders of the colonies. And the month before, Franklin, scholars believe, did the drawing and did the engraving of the printing block and it appeared in his Pennsylvania Gazette and you can't see it from here but oh you can see it there uh, every piece of the serpent is listed as one of the colonies and it's based on a French myth but that one every American child knew if you're gonna chop a snake up you have to bury the parts separately because snakes can get back together <laughs> and live now it's, it's a myth but it, this picture, immediately, even people who couldn't read, knew what, what the message was. Next, he was the most widely recognized figure in colonial America. So why is he barely recognized in the history books today? I'm Mary Nail from Cocoa Beach, Florida. I've studied civics and government all my life. I've been interested in it since I was 10. I never knew this information. It was shocking to me and so comforting to know that I finally know the truth. Now to a founding father completely erased from our history books. There probably wouldn't even be a revolution if it wasn't for this one man. His name, George Whitfield. One of the things you have to start with with Whitfield is that he was the best known person in colonial America, period. How is that possible? That's like all of a sudden, <laughs> I was going to say, actually, I could see this happening. That's like in 200 years, people saying, Michael Jackson, who, what? <laughs> I mean, that, he was that big of a rock star, right? Yes, he was. I mean, it's the equivalent of someone saying that, you know, they've never heard of Billy Graham or some, something like that right. for us not to know about Whitfield. He was the primary instigator of the Great Awakening of the 18th century. Uh, he spoke to and was seen by by far the most people in colonial America. I just want to set the scene a little bit. When he's young, he's over in England, and he's famous over in England first. He converts, he becomes a Methodist, um, but then he has kind of a really strange relationship or strained relationship with, with most of the preachers. 
that comes from uh, um, the preachers really being, um, you know, Church of England. It, it was like, you know, it was, it was like having Barack Obama give your sermon all the time, I'd imagine, where it's the government, you know, it's the government spin through the eyes of God. And they didn't really care about the poor because they want, the poor didn't vote, right? Mm -hmm. And he was the first guy that says, wait a minute, guys, they're out there, there are people out there cold and hungry. And that caused some real strain in England. Tell me about when he comes over here to America, what is his message that begins to light the fire for the American Revolution? As the 1760s went on, he did become very overtly involved with the crisis between Britain and the colonies. In fact, he may have been one of the earliest people from Britain to start warning the colonists that there was trouble coming. Uh, there's reports that in 1764 he came to America and said, there's trouble coming from Britain and your golden days are at an end, is the quote yeah. of what he, he said, and began warning people ahead of time that this, this was coming. He called then, it, there is a deep laid plot against right. your civil and religious liberties. And then when he... Hang on, hang on, just a second. <clears throat> ah, yeah. There is a, what was it again? A deep laid plot. There's a deep laid plot. Against both your civil and religious liberties, your golden days are at an end. What he said. My heart bleeds for you, America. That's right. And so when he goes back to England, he's there with Franklin, again, Amazing. his good friend Franklin. When Franklin testifies before Parliament on the colony's behalf because of their protests against the Stamp Act, and Whitfield, I think, behind the scenes, is advocating against the, the Stamp Act. And by the time you get to Whitfield's passing in 1770, and on his last trip to America, he dies in Massachusetts, the funeral sermons by the colonial pastors are saying, he is largely to thank for the repeal of the Stamp Act. And they say he was a true patriot, uh, not just in words, but also in actions. The Founders Friday series may have come to an end, but now it's your turn to help keep history alive. We'll tell you how next. Now that Founders Friday is over, there's still a lot of ways to get good history. When you pick up a biography about George Washington or George Whitfield or, or Benjamin Rush or John Jay or any founding father, always go to the back and see what the bibliography looks like. And if it cites a bunch of modern books, don't buy it. Get a book that cites the old books, the books that have their writings in it. Uh, our website at wallbuilders.com, we actually have a list of recommended reading items on Founding Fathers, so people can go buy them at the store or, or then go online and read these books. One of the really fun things to do to help history come alive is not only read biographies, but go see it as it's lived out. So you go to Williamsburg, Virginia, and there at Williamsburg, you get to see what colonial life was like, what it was for Patrick Henry and Jefferson and Washington. Or you jump over to, for example, Jamestown, and in Jamestown, you see what the early landing was like in the early 1600s. Or you go up to Plymouth Plantation, see what it would have been like to live as a pilgrim in Massachusetts. So there's no reason for Founders Fridays to stop in a personal manner. We just keep feeding ourselves, our history and our information that, that by and large we didn't get while we were in school. Like you just heard my good friend David Barton say, seek out the original documents of our founders. Read their own words. Read them to your children. Walk in their footsteps. Thank you to David Barton of Wall Builders, and thank you, our viewers, for embracing Founders Fridays. We ask that you would respect Memorial Day weekend. Have a good one, enjoy it with your family, but remember what it's all about, the men and women in our armed forces. Godspeed. From New York, good night, America.